welcome, welcome, welcome to another edition of Unscripted Faith. We are so glad you've invited us into your home or to wherever it is that you are. I'm J. Anthony Gilbert alongside Angela Madden. You know, I am so excited about what we are about to get oh, into yes. today. Yes, listen, coming up on Unscripted Faith, we've heard from pastors, but now it's time for the real scoop. Join us as we sit down with the authors of Pastors Wives mm. Tell All, where secrets, mm. surprises, mm. and Sunday morning mm. drama unfold. I'm telling Ooh. you, that reads like, that reads like a documentary. I'm about to sit down and watch a reality <laughs> TV show. We're joined now by three pastors' wives, all from different denominations. Wow. We've got Jenna, Jessica, and Stephanie, and we are so thankful to have you. Welcome to Unscripted Faith. Thank, thank, you. thank you for having us. <laughs> We're so excited. We love it. Listen. Well, you listen, I'm like a fly on the wall with all of this here. You know, my <laughs> wife is a pastor's wife, but she's not here. But y'all get a chance to chop it up. And I'm so glad yes. you get a chance to chop it up with them Same. and see what's going to happen. So let's just get right in on it. Why don't you go ahead and start us off? Because I think yes. you, got the, you got the message of the hour. Yeah, listen. Oh, ladies. <laughs> Your pastor's wives, that in and of itself tells us a whole yeah. lot, okay? Before mm. we dive in, tell us briefly, each of you maybe in about 15 seconds, your story. My name is Jenna. My husband's name is Ian, and we've been in ministry since we were married. We have two kids. He has been a youth pastor, and he is a worship pastor, and now he is in a discipleship pastor role. Wow. My name is Jessica, and my husband's name is Jonathan. We have two beautiful girls, Grace and Olivia, and he is a lead pastor here in our local town of Villa, and the church name is Village Church. Hi, I'm Stephanie, and I'm married to my husband, Isaac. We have been in ministry for 17 years. We absolutely love it. We are youth pastors, and we say we want to do this till we're 80, and we do <laughs> have three kids. I do love them. Stephanie, what's your last name? Let me hear it. <laughs> Gilbert. Your last name? Gilbert. Gilberts are in the house, y'all. No relation. We're related right. somehow. I don't Come know. On. I don't know. <laughs> You're going to be my new sister from another mister. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So how did you three from different denominations become friends? Okay, so it's kind of a fun story. I actually felt like the Lord was saying to bring the church together, starting with the women. I didn't know what that meant, but I thought, well, what better way to make that happen than a women's conference. And I'm going to bring in not just my leadership from my church, but leadership of women from other churches. And we're going to have this conference. And that's when I met Jessica, who then introduced me to Jenna. But you know what? The Lord had a different story because COVID happened and the conference never ended up wow. happening. But the Lord whispered something else about a podcast about speaking out about pastor's wives and what we go through in the behind the scenes. And guess what? The Lord has taken our honesty and our vulnerability, and he is bringing the church together, starting with the pastor's wives. It is insane what he is doing through this ministry. Well, what do what pastor's wives go through? I need, I need you to edu educate some people on what happens with pastor's wives that people don't understand. I love your, your message. You go to you talk to different churches and different people about yeah. what's happening. Tell us about the things that you all experience. Mm. Yeah, I think, well, we would all agree that growing up seeing pastor's wives, we thought that they were prim and proper. Maybe they were quiet. They didn't say a whole lot. Their marriage was probably perfect. Their oh, kids yeah. were perfect. They never misbehaved. <laughs> Angels. You had to wear a certain outfit to church. You had to look a certain way, act a certain way. You couldn't have tattoos. Ooh. Spoiler alert, we have tattoos. <laughs> but um, we all grew up with this idea of what a pastor's wife was supposed to look like. And so when we became pastor's wives, we, there's this unsaid expectation of what you're supposed to look like or act like. And we realized real quick that yeah. that was not us, that right. we are human, yeah. Yeah. human, just like you. The pressure was unbelievable. I think I even put pressure on myself yeah. Yeah. of what I was supposed to do. And I felt like I constantly lived behind a mask. Mm -hmm. I was not who God had called me to be. I was not walking in the calling he had given me specifically. It's just, it's hard. Yeah. It's yeah. hard. Very true. I mean, ditto to everything they just said. <laughs> <laughs> now, as a pastor's wife, it's easy to have all kinds of friends in your church, isn't it? Um, it's, well. I mean, 
I think like over the years, we, I didn't share, I was, I've been in ministry for 21 years with my husband. And I think we were youth pastors for over 12 of those years. And it was a little, I would say a little bit easier when, um, you know, we were youth pastors, we kind of hung out with the leaders that were part of our youth and everything, but you didn't really get to know the rest of the church, right? Cause you were kind of in your own little bubble in another building. Um, but now where we're at, it was hard at first. And I'm just going to be honest. I really didn't like women for a long time in my life. We brought a lot of drama <laughs> to the stage and I just wasn't about that life, but um, <laughs> God really changed my heart for women just in time for the role that Jonathan is in now as a lead pastor. And jo God really like transformed my mind to look at women all the same. And for me to stop looking at women, like I looked for friends in high school and start looking for all ages, all just everything different than me. I didn't need yeah. another friend that was like me. And so, but also to be vulnerable and know that I couldn't, I don't need to share yeah. everything, right? but I can share some. Mm -hmm. And and that really has broken yeah. down a lot of walls sure. within the church. I was about to say, I went through a lot of loneliness at first because once again, I was putting that mask on and I was afraid that I would accidentally gossip or accidentally do something wrong. So I was almost quiet and I felt like I didn't have anybody I could be fully real with. And I think a lot of pastor's wives mm -hmm. believe that, but we're trying to undo mm -hmm. that thinking yeah. because when authenticity and vulnerability happen from the top, yeah. it bleeds down to the bottom because guess what? If you're fake, mm -hmm. they're going to learn to be fake too. Yeah. They're not going to yeah. confess their sins one to another mm -hmm. like we're supposed to be doing as the church. That's right. So what's the balance then, ladies? Uh, because, you know, if you show too much, you can lose yeah. your ability to have influence. But yeah. if you don't, obviously, you know, you do want to be vulnerable, but share, share with us how we can be vulnerable, mm -hmm. but still keep our ability to have influence. I'll just share a story. So one Sunday morning, um, one of my, the ladies in the church walked in and she did, she looked like her and her husband had just gone through it and they were not on good terms. <laughs> and I remember walking up to her and saying, Hey, are you okay? And she ended up saying her and her husband had just gotten in a fight before they got here. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry, girl. I am the same way with Jonathan. Sometimes we are in the biggest fight right before we get here at the church. And I started to share some of the issues that he, him and I have had over the years. And she literally looked at me and she goes, I really just didn't think that y'all ever fought. And wow. she really just said that. And it like it, her shoulders dropped and she figured out in that moment that we're the same and that the pressure was gone. It's okay yeah. that I'm fighting with my husband. Yeah. Jessica does too. And yeah. I think it just made us, um, it just, it just brought us together in a cool way. And I think we have to do that. We don't have to go into detail of the drama. Right. We don't have to go in detail of what's happening in every kid's life, but we do have to open up. And I think that's where the church we've, we've gone anchored. wrong. Yeah. yeah um, sure. Because if we are supposed to be sharing our testimony with people, that's what changes lives, the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And we've stopped sharing our testimony with the church. And until we start doing that again, we're not going to see the change. That's right. Yeah. Wow. We're seeing a whole lot of problems right now in the church, a whole lot of wolves and sheep clothing yes. yeah. because we have built up this thinking this that thing. we, yeah. yeah, that we are better mm -hmm. than the rest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I get it. We are held to a higher standard, but yeah. you know what you need in order to have that standard accountability. Yeah. You yeah. cannot have accountability without vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And we do also talk about how we think that it's really important to have confessional community mm -hmm. with somebody that they might be in your church, but they also don't have to be in your church, mm -hmm. but have a close knit group of friends that you can share yeah. and that you can have them hold you accountable and pray for you mm -hmm. because you have to talk about these things, but use wisdom and discernment with who those people are in your life. But it is possible to have yeah. true friendship. Yeah. What is one of the biggest challenges you've had to personally navigate while being on the platform or being very visible to those you're leading? Hmm. Go ahead. Oh man, I, there's a lot. <laughs> um, for me, it really has been navigating the, the loneliness. I, I mean, honestly, and I know we already mentioned that, but for years that, that was my struggle being seen, but not known. I don't know if that makes yeah. any sense, yeah. but yeah. I was yeah. seen, but my heart was not known. My inner workings, my thoughts, my feelings. And that to me has been, that was a huge struggle that I'm now breaking free from. Go ahead. For me, I would say personally, it's the warfare, the warfare mm -hmm. within family and, and parenting kids. 
it, it, it's been rough, but I think that God has really truly shown me in the last few years that we have these tools that he's given us to fight the enemy. Yeah. And there are a lot of ministry leaders who are, you know, we, we know, we know the, the, you know, spiritual warfare scripture, we know about putting on the armor, but are we actually picking it up and using it in the way that it's meant to be used to fight the enemy? So there are, there are tools we can use to fight the enemy. I got a quick and question. I want yeah, to interject right there. Yeah. I want to ask a question. As I think that's phenomenal. Warfare is such a real yeah. thing that we all face. Absolutely. What, how do you and your husband navigate it? I know me and my wife, we face, we have certain tools that we use. What are the mm -hmm. tools you use to navigate warfare? Prayer, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Prayer, communication. I think yeah. the biggest thing is we can get so busy doing things for God that we stop being with God. And I think both of us individually yeah. have to be abiding in Christ and leaning into him, even when things get busy and taking that time and then yeah. to come together and communicate um, quality over quantity. And I think like when we stop and ministry becomes more important than our relationship and we stop being together, then the enemy has yeah. his way to attack right. and separate us. Yeah. Um, and so we really have to stay like bound together through Jesus and then to go together into ministry. And just when you mentioned abiding in Christ, like we have to be still yeah. and we have yeah. a problem with not being still with the Lord. We're too busy doing all these things. And I realized recently that I was kind of scared <laughs> of being the Mary because I was afraid of Martha's judgment. Yeah. whether that was me being the Martha judging myself or someone else, but we have to be with him. That is your biggest tool right there. Prayer in the word. Yeah. I think also too, just making sure that you're teaching your kids about the enemy too, yeah. like teaching them. There is a very real enemy and teaching them in their own little ways, how they can fight him. So I think, and putting up boundaries, yes. saying no, what happens is ministry leaders, pastors, and pastor's wives, we don't know the word no. And when we start to learn the word no and say yes to the God things and not just the good things, then there's going to be margin to be able to spend time with God. Yeah. What if people leave your church? Say, you tell people no. What if they leave your church, though? Well, then they weren't meant to be there. <laughs> we don't live for the approval of people. Like a true pastor's yeah. wife. Yeah. 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 We only live for the approval of one. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. It's not Amen. about numbers. It's about discipleship. Right. To create a culture. That's the biggest thing. If we create a new culture right. that there are boundaries, then we're going to teach people of the church to put up boundaries as That's well. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So you're telling us, ladies, that as a pastor's wife, you can say no, and that those who are in your church, if they hear no, it's not the end of the world. They can go to Jesus. Exactly. Preach. Oh, yes. wow. Right. Over I mean, that. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> let's just raise them up all the way. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love how you guys share so vulnerably, like you said, and open, because I do believe that is really what is needed. You had mentioned before about wolves and sheep clothing, and I do think a large part of that is because there is a misunderstanding yeah. that there is going to be a perfect person in a pastoral role, but it actually right. most often, hello, is the most unqualified person who has simply yeah. been called Preach. out by Jesus and put in this position, mm -hmm. and we're trying to navigate it together. Preach it. You know what I mean? Hey, man. You yes. ladies Say that again for those in the back. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. You are remarkable. We are so thankful for your voice and that you are helping mm -hmm. the church to really recognize that pastors and pastors' wives are not perfect. Mm -hmm. Don't expect Amen. perfection. But look no. to us and we can help to guide you and disciple and let iron sharpen iron. Thank yes. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Come back anytime. We need thank to have a regular so segment much. with these we guys. We do. That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> It's such a blessing. Thank you for having us yeah, on. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, ladies. Well, with Halloween just around the corner, there's a common question that's on the minds of many believers. Our very own Pastor Amy Schaefer tackles this question and more on this week's edition of Ask Amy. Hi, and welcome to this segment of Ask Amy. What I really want to do during this season is just skip through all of it and get right the Christmas movies. Can we do that? But if you don't know, or maybe your head's in the sand, for Christian communities today, there are many responses to Halloween. There's the rejection, there's the total acceptance, or the redemption of Halloween. 
it's safe to say that Halloween has become one of the most marketable and culturally popular celebrations on our calendar. Clever marketing schemes across streaming channels contribute to Halloween's growing popularity. Spending for Halloween is predicted, are you ready, to cross $10 billion for the first ever. Tell you what, and according to a variety of statistics, Halloween's participation is only going to grow and keep on growing. So today's question is, should Christians be dressing up in costumes? I'm so glad you asked. Here's one thought for you. Thought number one, you are the light. So dress like the light. There's a way you can dress up and you can be the light instead of being the darkness. There are some evil things out there. Even driving around, I see these skeletons. They're about 30 feet tall hanging over houses. And I'm thinking, that's not light. That is death and darkness. Thought number two, dressing up as Bible characters, everyday heroes, firemen, policemen, doctors, nurses, or cowboys, or your favorite movie character is not evil. I remember my mom, you know, growing up making me my favorite costume ever. I was E.T. phone home with the red finger. Full mask. If I had it today, I would wear it for you. Number three, you are a model. Be generous with your life. And in this season of Halloween and dressing up and giving candy, be led for you, your kids, your family. Here's a scripture that I completely love in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of Christ to the world. Wow. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. In the, the message translation, it says, here's another way to put it. And I think this is huge. You are here to bring, to be the light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We are going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If, if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I put you here on a hilltop and on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives by opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So whether it's a pirate you want to dress up as, or a cowboy, how did they, our partner? Whether it's a doctor or a nurse or a police officer, this is the only thing that you need to remember this season, that you are a daughter of the King. You're a son of the Most High God. You represent Him here on this earth. So, at our house here, we'll leave the light on for you. That's Ask Amy, and I'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Well, I'm so glad I have an opportunity to chime in. I love Pastor Amy and Pastor Buck. They are phenomenal people, but I have to disagree. Uh-oh. Oh, snap. Bring it to us. I have to disagree. Uh, I, I understand tomato, tomato. You got to do what you feel you need to do. Um, for me, I understand the origin of Halloween. And... Um, when you understand everything about it, and I encourage any person that has ever participated in it to do a, a, an in-depth research on Halloween. When you understand the purpose behind dressing up was to be able to counteract the demonic spirits that were coming in. When you take a look at when they have jack-o'-lanterns and the purpose behind it, they would actually cut them out of gourds and they would put human fat from human sacrifice and they would burn it in order to ward off uh, demonic spirits. The whole purpose behind it, it is the most demonic day of the, of the year, satanically. It is a time when human sacrifices take place. Uh, it is a time, that stuff still happens today, by the way. It is a time when the veil between uh, the spirit realm is the thinnest and we're still participating. Even if we're dressing up in 
uh, well, I'm going to dress up as Jesus. I'm going to dress up as this. The purpose behind the dressing up is demonically influenced. And it was a way, so for us, we don't celebrate it. We don't celebrate it in our church. We're very, very educational with our kids and with people so they understand all of that as well. So for us, we don't do that. And I don't have time to preach on it because we're going to run out of time. But the reality is, is that there's so much behind it uh, that a lot of people don't understand. So we have chosen to educate our people to, I have no problem with, uh, I take, I'll take my kids out of school if they were in public school. I take them out of there and just give them all the candy they want. We make sure all of our kids in our church, they get boatloads of great candy, but don't have to participate and do any of those things to make sure I believe in being light means to come out from among them and be separate, not participate and doctor it up with a little bit of Jesus. Just don't <laughs> be a part of it at all. So when they come by mine in, in, uh, in our uh, neighborhood, light will be off. But turn your light on after Halloween is over and when no one else has it on, you shine for Jesus. That's my take. Well, go ahead and shine then. I'm going to shine. I, I, I was going to ask you, how do your boys feel about not getting candy? But you go ahead and take no, care of that. They get more candy than anybody else. They can go to the store. They can pick out anything they want. Yes. I want them to realize when they live for Jesus, they get more than what other people are doing. They don't have to participate in anything. It's, think about it. All month, it's all fear. Well, fear fest, well, fear fest, fear well, fest. Everything demonic, everything demonic. I, I don't want to be a part of that. Yeah. I want to be separate. So... I'm sorry, but go ahead. I, I know you no, got to have a minute, so go no, on in there. You're not wrong. I, I like that take, and I have tried to convince my girl, you know, just for the mere fact, when you pass out candy in my neighborhood, they are full-size candy bars and yeah. king-size candy bars. King size. So I said, girls, um, you know, you could take this $200 that mom and dad are going to have to spend to be able to have candy for some kids, and you could go and we could go and have some fun at one of these adventure parks or something. How's that sound? <laughs> I'm always trying to negotiate with <laughs> yeah, them, you yeah, know, yeah. but I like that perspective, Jay. I think that is really, um, it's really helpful. I can remember as a little girl telling one of my best friends who is now in <laughs> ministry, I said, that's the devil's holiday. Oh, she went to crying and went oh, home yeah, to her yeah, mom, yeah, yeah. you know, but um, so my kids and I, I do let them get dressed up. I do let them pass, receive candy and mm -hmm, we pass out mm -hmm, candy. Mm -hmm. um, but as we were talking even earlier, like we go past the scary houses. They've got anything that looks scary. My babies look at me, they go, mommy, the blood of Jesus. Blood, mom, I said, that's blood. right, the blood that's of Jesus, right. baby. Let's keep on walking. <laughs> So I think that, um, I think like you said, I think there is something to be said about what, why the holiday originated. But did you also know that October 31st was actually the beginning of the Protestant Reformation? It was when Martin Luther nailed that 95 thesis to that door um, and to call us back to the essence, the, the, the Christ alone, you know, God to God, the glory. Um, and, so and think about that, though. That's the reason why the devil would put Halloween in there. Well, well, because well, now it takes away from one of the greatest reformation. I didn't even know that, to be yes. honest with you. Isn't but that so, cool? And that's how the devil works. And what does he always do? He makes everything cute and neat. Oh, well, it's about the kids and all that. So now we don't have any, uh, I, when I say respect, we don't have any respect for the things of God and also understanding that those demonic things, yeah. that's why our kids are battling today is yes. because of all that stuff. And between October 31st and the end of the year, you will see more people dying suddenly, unexpected deaths, all those things because the demonic influence. But anyways, I know wow. you're talking about the Reformation no, era, no. but I didn't even it's know good. that. Yeah, isn't that powerful? That was amazing. Listen, when we return in 60 seconds, you're gonna find out more about Jay and myself and you might find that some of these are pretty funny facts. In fact, you may find yourself laughing at our answers. Stick around for more of Unscripted Faith after this. When you give to Cornerstone Television this month, we'll send you Encouraging Words for a Discouraging World by Dr. Jeremiah. Filled with encouraging and inspiring words, Dr. Jeremiah helps you navigate the difficulties of daily life with faith, courage, and resilience. He shares practical insights and timeless wisdom from the Bible that will help you find hope, comfort, and strength even in the darkest of times. This book includes biblical examples of hope that will inspire you during challenging seasons, inspiring teachings on how to claim victory even in the hardest of times, practical wisdom for holding God's promises in your heart. Whatever hardship you're facing, encouraging words for a discouraging world will help you find perspective, hope, and a renewed sense of purpose. Request your copy today as our thank you gift when you give to CTVN. To give, call 888-665-4483 or go to ctvn.org slash donate. 
Well, you know Pastor Jay and I like to have fun, and so we're going to take a moment and answer some <laughs> fish bowl <laughs> questions. So, Pastor Jay, what you got there? Let's, Let's see, see. What do we got? <laughs> all right. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Night owl. Night owl. That's uh, my nature. How about you? Both. I don't sleep. So, oh. uh, I mean, I sleep about you know, maybe five hours a night. Yes. Uh, and I mean, so I mean, I'm both. Yeah. I mean, I really, but I, if I had to guess, like, as far as what my mood is like in the morning, once I get my morning prayer going, yes. then I'm ready to talk and hang out. But um, at night, I'm, you know, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done after a certain amount of time. So, See, I could, uh, that, that's when I'm most inspired, most creative at is at night. Yeah. Okay. But I've had to become a morning person. I'm up every morning by 4.30. You, know, you have energy yeah. all the time, so yeah. I don't even. We do. Let's go. Let's yeah. get the next one. <laughs> Okay, so what was the worst job oh, you man. ever had? Oh, man, you don't even have to ask me twice. I know exactly. Now, this is no hate on anybody that's watching. I mean, if this is what you do, it's just my makeup. I was a dishwasher at Perkins. And that was not Perkins. Y'all know about Perkins around yes, here? Yes, I, I know about, about Perkins, Perkins from Now, they got Ohio. great peanut butter pie. I know that, but uh, I, it, was, it was the worst job. I mean, just thinking about it can make a brother want to cuss. Did you? Like, I mean, did it make you want to throw up? It's not that. It was just laborious. I didn't like it. I mean, I was in one little area, and all I did was look at dirty dishes all day long. I, it was the only job I ever got out of there. When I got out of there, I was so glad I got delivered. I felt like the children of Israel when they came out of the, out of Egypt after 430 years. I was free. I was like, we free now. We free. I was so excited to be out of there. So, all right, last one. I got to read yours here. <laughs> oh, did you answer yours? No, go, worst go. job. No, we'll worst go job. Go ahead. I didn't really have a worst job, so let's go. Never? I loved all my all jobs. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. Uh, what's something you love that people wouldn't expect? Oh, my favorite thing is to be home in my pajamas, cuddled up under a blanket with my babies, and I will. I struggle to not choose that every day. Mm. Like that's that's legit a struggle for like I I love that more than anything. Like I know I'm a people person, mm -hmm. but I would choose that every day of the week. How about you? Uh, I'm the opposite. Uh, <laughs> people that don't know this about me. I love being alone. You could put me on an island by myself for a year, yes. and I come back smiling more than the cream of wheat man. I mean, I would be a happy <laughs> man. I do not man. like the cream wheat. You know the cream man. Cream wheat. He's always smiling. He's always <laughs> grinning. <laughs> I would, I have no issue being alone. I love it because people think like they look at me on camera or they look at yeah. me on the pulpit or on a platform and they see all this energy and they yeah. think like, oh, he must be a people person. Completely wrong. I love being alone. Okay, so I do love being with people. I'm energized. So whenever I leave a crowd of people, I am zippity doodah. I mean, I've got energy for days. And I pass you know? out. And you, that's how my husband is. Yeah, that's how my Nate yeah, is. Yeah. He, he's great with people, but when he's done, he's like, honey, I got to go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. I got to recharge. <laughs> Now, my wife is that way. She loves it. She can light up a room, this, that, and the third. Me, I can do it, but I'd rather get out. Yeah, well, I, I understand that. Yeah. Listen, I love that because, you know, these things that they don't know about you, Jay, you're a pastor, right? right. Your, your people don't know that. And that's what I loved about even the ladies, Jenna, Jessica, and Stephanie. They're pastor's wives. And these fishbowl questions are great for you guys to get to know us. But I love that being able to hear from them, we're yeah. able to get a better picture of what it is to walk through life as a pastor's wife or a pastor put on a platform, but you're just an ordinary person. And that's what these questions give us too, is let's just know that we're just regular people that yes. we have to wake up every morning just like everyone else. That's exactly right. Yeah. We all go through our stuff. Listen, God's got a great purpose and a plan for you. Live vulnerably, live open, and be real. We'll see you next time. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.